Hello, this recording is in regard to a few simple contrasts. Um, I could call it the inner compass. I uh, will talk about um, pride as distinct from shame and, you know, the particular meaning that I have for pride, um, a very positive meaning, not, not the same as arrogance or haughtiness or vanity. Um, the next set of three, of the three pairs is, um, I'm trying to remember, uh, well, one of them is anxiety and trust. That's actually the last one I'll talk about. And then the middle one is, oh boy, guilt and commitment. So I wrote this, uh, a day ago and here we go. We'll talk about a few simple contrasts now. These are contrasts between three attractive outcomes and three repulsive outcomes or experiences. Effects. Can you tell the difference between the experience of pride and of shame? If you're not clear yet on exactly how to produce those experiences, I'm about to tell you. I'm going to tell you the formula for producing pride and the formula for producing shame. Now the twist with all of this is uh, I'm not really presenting this in a way that you're going to produce intentionally more or less shame or pride. I'm actually going to talk about these things as kind of spontaneous um, manifestations where when there is pride, you can kind of consider, okay, if pride is a signal of the thing that I'm going to tell you it's a signal of, then you can look back at how does that relate to your recent experience that produced that spontaneous experience of pride. And same thing generally with regard to shame. Uh, if you experience shame, if you notice that, then you can look back at, well, how did that develop? What was the roots that led to that effect of shame? So shame and pride, uh, in addition to you know being powerful, intense things, um, they're powerful and intense so that we notice them, and then we can then look back at um, what led to them and learn. So there is a you know wide open receptivity toward the experience of shame as well as pride implicit in this talk. So I'm about to tell you exactly how to produce shame and how to produce pride. <coughs> um, and it certainly um, could be relevant, I'm, I'm, I may not get into this at all, but it could be relevant to consider if I want to um, kind of evoke pride in someone how would I do that? Or if I want to evoke shame in someone for some reason, why would I do that? Or how would I do that? Um, even why would I do that? But that's, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to get to that. So, pride. When I am effective in producing a result that fits with my motivations, I experience pride. When you are effective in producing a result that fits with your motivations, you experience pride your innate motivations, your natural motivations, not necessarily motivations that were externally um, programmed into you. Those aren't, uh, I'm not counting those as your motivations. Those are external motivations that you can um, adopt, but they're not yours in the sense of innate motivations. They're fine. They could be very valuable, but they're not what I mean by your motivations. So sometimes you become aware of this experience of pride because of someone, uh, because of something that someone says to you, they say something, and then you experience pride, and as a result of what they said, and you hearing what they said, and then you, you know, it registers, and you're like, wow, yeah, I, I feel proud. So, it could be something someone says to you that triggers pride. It could be something that you witness casually, like seeing your grandchild walk for the first time, and you just have this surge of pride. So this experience of pride is an internal experience. It does not require anyone else's validation. If if uh, somebody you know denies, uh, somebody um, condemns it or um, says it's not you know you shouldn't feel pride or that's not pride that you're feeling. But it doesn't really make any difference fundamentally to the experience. It's just a spontaneous manifestation uh, physically that we can say, wow, that's pride, it's, that feels great. So it doesn't require anyone's validation, it's not really subject to, um, it's not, you know, it, it is possible for other people to criticize us and, and validate uh, the experience of pride or shame us, um, but in that case, that's them shaming us, and that's a really distinct thing from the pride itself. 
the pride inherently is internal. It's you could say subjective, um, and how other people respond to it or not, whether they notice it or not, those are s- distinct issues. So I'm going to suggest here that no one can talk you out of pride. They can interrupt the pride, but you still have the pride. You know, the pride came up. They're not going to tell you that wasn't pride and have you believe it. You had a surge of pride. You know, imagine that you had a surge of pride and then somebody interrupts it or distracts you or whatever. That's That can happen. The pride was still pride. It doesn't change because of what someone said to you. You can have a new experience because of interaction with somebody, but that pride itself is pride, regardless of what somebody says or doesn't say. Nobody can talk you into pride. If they say something to you and it triggers pride, all right, but nobody talks you into pride. It's a spontaneous experience that you have when you are effective in producing a result that fits with your motivations. You don't have to know that those are your motivations um, or you don't have to admit them. When you're effective at something and it produces pride, that means that the thing you were just effective at really aligns with your innate motivations. So pride is a signal about our innate motivations or mine or yours or whoever's. So no one can talk you out of pride. Nobody can talk you into it. It is a spontaneous internal confirmation. What does it confirm? It confirms that you have been effective in some way that's related to an innate motivation. doesn't mean you won't be further effective at later times. Like somebody who's watching a, a grandchild walk for the first time that, that in, you know, if I feel proud about seeing my grandchild walk, then I'm going to continue interacting with them. I'm going to encourage them more. I'm going to have them, you know, running, jumping, shooting basketball hoops. Oh my God, you made it! You know, in the little, the little four foot tall hoop or whatever. But we have these ongoing experiences of pride. They're not like, oh, now I've had pride. And, uh, you know, that's the end of it. No, it's just a, a transitional thing. It's a confirmation that I know that I've done something that really feels good for me. I know I've been infe- effective in it. Like, it, watching a grandchild may be a little bit of an odd thing, but to, to use it as an example, but I know that I've taken actions that resulted in some way, however directly, isn't really the issue. I've done something to, to witness this child, grandchild, whatever, walking, shooting their little, you know, eight-inch wide ball into the four-foot-tall plastic basketball hoop, and there's that just huge excitement that I feel with them. I don't even have to say it, you know, I don't have to, I could see it on a video, you know, a year later, and still feel pride, and notice that what I'm calling pride here, in that case, is love, and yet I still feel that sense of, I've been effective somehow. When I, when I watch any kid, you know, uh, throw a ball into a, into a hoop, I don't feel a surge of pride. Um, I might feel, oh, wow, they're, that's delightful, they're delighted, I get, you know, that's funny, I feel delight with it. That's, that's one thing. But if it's my grandchild, and I see my grand toddler, grandbaby cried, <laughs> grand toddler, I just made up a word, grand toddler. If I see my grand toddler walk, or my baby, a grandchild, uh, you know, six years old, or five, or whatever they are, and they, th- four, <laughs> they throw, you know, remember the little, they throw the ball into the hoop, <laughs> then I feel pride, distinct from if I see just any kid do it. Um, I was just thinking, you remember the little ones that have the suction cups, the little basketball hoop that has the suction cups and you can put it on your refrigerator or something and then you throw like the little maybe three inch diameter ball into that. So when I was a little tiny kid, I practiced and then I made it and I feel proud that I made it. If I'm watching as an uncle or as a grandparent or whatever it may be, I can feel a surge of pride at the child's um, effectiveness because it's my effectiveness. It's my child, my even my nephew, whatever, if I've been showing my nephew how to, how to do basketball and then my nephew gets it right, then I feel pride about that. So it's a spontaneous and internal confirmation. Um, nobody, you know, nobody else has to say anything about it, but it's kind of natural that we do share it socially. Hey, Grandpa, look at what I can do, right? Um, there's this surge of pride and kind of a bonding thing that, that uh, will go on with that. 
with, with uh, the accomplishment, the effectiveness. Yeah, it can be as simple as the ability to throw, throw a little you know, three-inch diameter ball through a hoop. For a, for a little kid, that fits their internal motivations, their innate motivations. If they have pride about it, then it fits their innate motivations. If they ride a bicycle and are proud of it, it fits their innate motivations. If they ride a bicycle and are like, oh, it's a relief, I'm not going to get teased now. Well, that's a completely different kind of experience. Certainly valid. We'll come back to that later. So you may be aware that there can be different uses of the same word to mean different things. I want to raise this in regard to the word pride here because there are some very popular texts that translate certain foreign words into the English word of pride. So they'll say things about you know, that there'll be a phrase that uses the word pride, translated from some other language. So I'm suggesting that those translations that use the English word of pride are mistranslations, lots of mistranslations, or we could say imprecise or poor translations. Someone can be proud and also be modest in relation to their pride. That may sound unusual, but again, the examples of um, you know, maybe the little kid isn't modest about their pride. Maybe when the grandparent sees their grandchild walk, they tell everybody, and they're not modest about it. Here's the video, here's the pictures. They don't have to be modest, but they could be modest. There's nothing inherently conflicting between that internal experience of pride and then the social, you know, dynamic of, of modesty. Um, so someone can be proud and also be modest in relation to their pride or the, the source of their pride. Um, in other words, people can be secretive about the source of their pride. They can be discreet about who they share it with or how they share it. They can be very um, delicate and you know quiet and you know private about it. And that's typically what we mean by modesty. They're not drawing a lot of attention themselves from anyone. They're not seeking validation. They're just like sharing with people that that they're delighted to share it with. And you know if they um, don't have any uh, discretion or whatever, if they just widely share it with everybody, you could say it's immodest, but I don't care. If you care, why? Somebody's proud, they share it with whoever they share it with. Look at this picture of, you know, my grandkid. Okay, like, you know, look at this trophy I won, or look at this result that I produced, um, you know, in my job or in my hobby. If they share it with somebody, why is that? immodesty. Just to share it with somebody doesn't, I don't know, you don't have to criticize, we don't have to criticize that as immodesty. We could, we'll, get, we'll come back to that later, I think. Um, why is it that people would criticize that, you know, as far as jealousy, perhaps? So, um, typically, when people repeat ancient warnings about pride that have been translated from other languages, the original warnings were clearly not about what we would in English call pride, but they were about being immodest, being haughty, being vain, being arrogant. And when I say being immodest, I mean immodest in extreme ways. Um, so all of those states are states of instability, social insecurity, even shame. And those states involve a pretense of pride, a pretense of self-respect, you might say rather than actual pride. That's the absence of pride. An arrogant person isn't proud. They're pretending to be proud in order to, uh, you know, manipulate other people's perceptions. They're not confident. They're not proud. They're trying to hide the absence of pride. So there's an absence of pride. They're trying to hide it. And that, uh, or they're trying to, you know, attract social validation. That's often associated with the word vanity. Arrogance is claims of, you know, superiority or whatever, competence. Vanity is uh, just the obsession with external uh, validation. Haughtiness, pretty similar to arrogance. Immodest means um, sharing one's successes, one's successes in a way that I, isn't socially, uh, you know, appropriate for whatever social context. So, immodesty is probably the least um, severe of those words. So, now, I have an example. Imagine someone in distress shouting, you should not be so proud of yourself. You should be ashamed. So, they're criticizing someone else for being proud. A very interesting thing, perhaps. What is the experience of that person who's shouting like that? 
Why are they so upset? I'll repeat what, what I scripted for them to say. You should not be so proud of yourself. You should be ashamed. I think I'm going to do this in a Mickey Mouse voice now or some other silly voice because I want to emphasize the words and the emotion behind the words as two distinct things, but both you know clear things that you can observe. You should not be so proud of yourself. You should be ashamed. Okay, I think that was Jar Jar or whatever, that character from one of those Star Wars movies. Um, I'm clear that that is not Donald Duck or Mickey Mouse, so I don't need any criticisms about that. If you want to criticize that, feel free. Let's do it again. Here's Jar Jar saying, oh, it's going to be even more distressed now. You should not be so proud of yourself. You should be ashamed. Jar Jar, by the way, clearly is um, Asian. All right. <clears throat> so, what is the experience of Jar Jar as they say those things? Why are, is Jar Jar so upset? They're not a. Sh they are. Sorry. They are. Sorry. I'm just. I just want to apologize real quick. I stuttered. I promise, never, ever, 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 ever to stutter again, ever to ever st 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 stutter. Shit. Okay. When Jar Jar said, "You should not be so proud of yourself," and you should be ashamed. That was Jar Jar in a mode of kind of harassment. Jar Jar was ashamed, but pretending not to be ashamed and saying, don't display pride. They were invalidating and you know discouraging someone from displaying pride or experiencing pride, but in particular displaying it. You should not be so proud of yourself. You should be ashamed. Um, so Jar Jar was jealous but pretending not to be jealous. They are angry and they're distressed. So they're distressed and they're angry. This other person is displaying pride. Uh, Jar Jar is frustrated. Pride is absent for them. There's this um, intense social competitiveness and anxiety about you know, what other people are doing or not doing or should do or all that. Um, Self-respect is absent for them. Now I'm setting all that up as a pretty extreme case. It's, it's certainly possible for um, Jar Jar to, uh, <clears throat> to pause for a moment. I'm sorry. You are recording? 